Okay, am I on? You can hear me? Good. These ladies were laughing over here because they worked with me for <laughs> several years, and they know. You know, they'd write something, I'd say, um, you need to do something with this. <laughs> oh, goodness. But I couldn't have done it without them. Oh, my. Well, uh, thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be here. Um, this all began uh, in July. A church in Colorado asked if I would come and do a retreat, and I agreed. And, um, and they, t they started off by saying that the theme was um, refresh your soul. And so I'd spent some time thinking about that, and pretty soon I realized I can't refresh my soul. Uh, and that Jesus is the one who refreshes our soul. And Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, came to mind, come to me, come to me. I will give you rest. Come to me and refresh your soul. And so that just kind of shifted the emphasis. And uh, I, in communication, I just said, can we do this? Come to me, refresh your soul. And so that's how that evolved. And then Utah is just not very far from Colorado. And um, I thought about it, and I went to my husband, Jim, and I said, you know, you know, Utah's just not very far from Colorado. It's just a short flight from Denver to Salt Lake City. Um, would it be okay if I went? And he said, sure. And then um, I, I called, and I said, well, I'm coming. And since I will have done all of this preparation, if, if you would like to do anything, I would be willing to do it. And so they are so gracious. These folks are so gracious and said, sure. So here I am. We get a lot of invitations in the mail. You know, we get invitations to lunch and to dinner. Uh, the audiologist wants us to come and learn all about hearing aids. Uh, we get uh, invitations from the investment, some investment company, because they want us to use their services. Or, you know, we've even gotten an invitation from several different mortuaries, so we could buy a, a prepaid burial plan. Well, we have just kind of dropped those quickly in the wastebasket. <clears throat> but isn't it wonderful when you get an invitation from someone who loves you? You know they have invited you. They want you. They think you're special enough to include. How wonderful to get that invitation. Well, I'm glad that you've accepted the invitation to come tonight. And you may have had to overcome some obstacles in order to get here, you know, children, husbands, uh, work, uh, whatever. There may have been some conflicts even. Um, but I'm glad that you've made the choice to be here. You may have come because a friend asked you or you may have read that article in the newspaper, and I don't know that I'm going to say a whole lot about that, but let me tell you, is Janae here? Janae Francis, who wrote that? Let me tell you, that woman, the whole time I was talking to her on the phone, was just doing this, and I could hear her, and, and I thought, she is really fast. And then when I read what she said, I was stunned because I think she wrote it as, as quickly as I said it. Most of all... I hope that you are here because you heard Jesus whisper, come to me, come to me. I want you to listen and watch as um, we see this invitation. Jim, you can do that. <clears throat> Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. For my, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Jesus' invitation to us. As I was uh, thinking long before I ever started putting pen to paper, uh, I, woke, I woke 
And every day, probably for the last uh, three months, the first thought that has been in my mind is, come to me, refresh your soul. And one morning, as I got up and went to the table to begin my quiet time, uh, I just started writing down, Lord, uh, I've been awake for a long time. I've had you on my mind. I was eager to come and meet with you. And uh, thinking about the retreat and uh, what he had for me. And then uh, I just had this picture in my mind of a beautifully set table for two. (coughs) And I imagined it beautifully set, elegantly set, and it suggested to me privacy, uh, intimacy, favor, um, and I knew that it was like Jesus saying, come to me. Just come and spend this time with me. You know, come and let me set the feast of my word before you and the living water that I have. Come to me. And so that's the table, and I want you to have that in your mind as you think about uh, some of the things that we share that I share tonight. Um, I would say that I have two things to share with you primarily. Um, I'll share some of my story of what's happened in the last three years, and then uh, I, I, if we had time, we'd be digging into God's Word. And I'm going to be sharing something that happened to me uh, in God's Word a little bit later. But I'm going to challenge you to a rigorous commitment to spend time every day with Jesus Christ in the Word. And so I'll be giving you some spiritual appetizers. So where are you in your walk with the Lord You know, that's the first question of the Bible. Where are you? And it's the the question that God asks us as well. Where am I? Well, let me tell you, three years ago this coming weekend, uh, we were in the midst of packing up to leave Washington, Vermont, where we had been for six years. And um, those of you who know me know that every move we've made has been very difficult for me. Uh, My roots go down slowly, but they go down deep, and pulling them out is painful. But I've thought a lot about uh, what happens. You know, we talk about how difficult change is, and it is, but I've come to kind of a new understanding of why it is so difficult. It's not those external things, necessarily, it is that when we move out of the comfort zone, the, the schedule is completely different, uh, new routines, we don't know the ropes yet, uh, wondering about how we fit in this new place. It seems to be that all of those internal questionings and doubts and struggles that we have manifest themselves in a new way. And that's what happened to me. We moved from uh, Washington, Vermont, where um, James was pastor of the only little church in the village, and it was wonderful. We had a wonderful six years there. But we uh, were coming to the beginning of a new season. It wasn't just a new chapter. It was almost like a new book. Uh, James was finishing his full-time pastoral ministry. Uh, We were moving halfway across the country where both of our children live and our grandchildren. And while that is absolutely wonderful, it is not without its own stresses. You know, oh, Mom, could we stop by? Oh, yes, that will be right there. You know, and they're around the corner. And, uh, And then they come, and they are there for quite a little while sometimes, and it didn't make any difference what was on the agenda. At the same time, uh, we have the joy of investing in those young lives. And James would say that his new higher calling is being Papa, and he rules the roost at our house. They come to the door, where's Papa? Where's Papa? And I'm going, wait a minute, I'm the one who bakes the cookies. Come on here. 
but they they love him and he loves them and he is so grateful to be there. In addition, my husband's mother, who was 90 at the time, was going to be coming and staying with us three to four months of the year. Everything about it was different. Uh, He was becoming an intentional interim pastor. It's also called a transitional pastor, someone who will come and be there through um, a time when a full-time pastor is not there. That was a new thing, and I didn't exactly know how I fit in there. Um, And finally, I think I'm comfortable with it now after two uh, intentional interims. God just said, you do what you always do. You love the people, and you teach the word, and that's our whole philosophy of ministry. But in the middle of all of that, I had to face some things about myself. I I saw questions come up, doubts come up, things that I thought I'd settled a long time ago. I um, was just, I had this restlessness uh, underneath. I I said, God, where are you in the middle of this? Uh, I, I would say something is missing, or I would just be in a battle royal with self. I was the Roman seven woman. The things I didn't want to do, I was doing. The things I wanted to do, I wasn't doing. In fact, one Sunday, <clears throat> we came home, and I walked in the house, and I just said, I'm sick of me. And it was like, James is looking at me. Oh, what's, what's happening here? But there was something, I felt something was missing. I was hungry for more experience of of God on a daily basis and to experience his peace and his presence. And um, so my mode, you get busy, you know, let me let me do this. Let me do that. You know. Oh, let's see. Let me become involved in that. And um, you know, uh, A. W. Tozer has said something to the effect that the greatest heresy of man is that we get busy or active or productive or whatever, because we do that to try to make ourselves acceptable to God. Nah, you know that doesn't work. We just wear ourselves out we become weary and heavy laden. And so that was happening to me. And finally, I just cried out to God and said, what do you want me to do? And in the way that only God can, he spoke to my heart and said, I don't want you to do anything. I just want you to let me love you. And then I cried out, I don't know how to do that. And he said, be still and know that I am God. Be still. Now, my husband would tell you that may sound very good and may sound very simple, but he also knows I don't do nothing very well. And so I'm still kind of bustling about and restless. But I go, I go to look at Psalm 4610, tried and trying to figure out what's going on in that passage. And I've left my glasses down there, which don't help me at all. <clears throat> so I went to Psalm 4610 and And look to see what it was that God seems to be saying in that. And in the midst of this psalm that is uh, about God as our mighty fortress, he says, be still and know that I am God. Well, the Hebrew word for be still there means let go of your grip. Hmm. Hmm. Let go of your grip. Uh, I read something else just in the last day or so. It was like, just go limp. <laughs> you know, oh, oh that, that was, that's a good image, you know. But just let go of your grip. And as I meditated on that, that suggested letting 
go of control. Anybody have control issues? Huh? Yeah, yes, well, let go of your grip, ladies. <clears throat> Perhaps it could also be interpreted, let go of your limited understanding. The New American Standard Bible reads, cease striving instead of be still. And perhaps it could read, cease striving in your own human effort. When we cease striving and begin letting go, you and I will open ourselves to a whole new dimension of relationship with God. The Amplified Bible says, let be and be still. Perhaps that's where recovery programs and 12-step programs get let go and let God. Um, In other words, allow God to be God. I want you to say with me, be still and know that God is God. Be still and know that God is God. All right, I just want you to sit there in silence for a moment and let that settle down in your mind. Be still and know that I am God. Know means to recognize and understand. Since we're such slow learners, at least I am, it's as if God says, allow me to be God. Recognize that I am God. Or another way of saying it is, he's God and you're not. I'm not. His command to be still certainly got my attention, kind of stopped me in my tracks, and I needed to stop. I needed to reassess every aspect of my life in light of his command. For the coming days, I meditated on Psalm 4610 and kept thinking about that, but the restlessness was there. Then I started thinking about restlessness. Restless means without rest. And you add N-E-S-S, that suffix, it's the state of being without rest. And think about that. Isn't that what happens when we get agitated and restless? There is no rest. There's no peace. And once again, I cried out, Lord, how? How do I rest? Because he says, you come and I will give you rest. But trying to put those things together was difficult. And then came that loving invitation, come to me, refresh your soul. So I began thinking about that and spending time. So let's think for a moment just about that phrase, come to me. I love this hanging that this precious woman has done for us. And Come to me. Notice, it's not to the church not to a creed, not to a clergyman, not to a prophet or a priest, not to an organization, not to the waters of baptism, not to the communion table. We are invited to a personal relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. The table suggests that fellowship. From the Garden of Eden... Through the Israelite desert, through many, many battles, throughout the land of Galilee, to the cross on Golgotha, to the wedding feast of the Lamb, the bride from the beginning, Genesis 3.19 to Revelation 22.17, when the bride and the church, I mean, I'm the bride and the Lord say, come, that's what it is repeated over and over, sometimes quietly, tenderly, sometimes urgently, passionately. Come back to me. Here I am. Turn to me. Listen to me. Remember me. I'm waiting. Wake up, he says. But he says, come to me, come to me, come to me. Max Lucado says, come to me are God's favorite three words. 
But he says, come to me. He's still calling out. Come to me and refresh your soul. So what exactly does that mean? Come to me. So I was thinking about who is this me? And if we had open Bibles, I would ask you to turn to Colossians 1 and um, look at that because in verse 13 it says, he is our rescuer. Verse 14, he's our redeemer forgiver. Verse 15, he's the image of the invisible God. Verse 16, he is creator. Think about that. Back there when it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him, by him, for him. Hmm, he's creator God. Verse 17 says he's the sustainer of all life. Has, I'm wondering, has anyone seen the Leo Giglio uh, series, the Passion series? And, and he, talks, he talks about laminin, what, what hold, the cellular unit that holds all of our, our bodies together. Well, when he looks at that in the microscope, it's in the shape of a cross. Oh, praise God. How wonderful. But then to think, you know, if he snapped his finger, those stars would fall. The earth would tilt on its axis just enough and we wouldn't be able to bear the heat or the cold. He holds it all together. He holds us together. Gravity, think about that. If suddenly he decided to suspend it, we'd be in the air. That movie that's going on out there now wouldn't make any difference because we'd all be out there. <laughs> wouldn't that be weird? Ah, oh, yes. <clears throat> Verse 18 says he's head of the church. Verse 18 also says that he's all in all. He's the preeminent one. He's above all. Verse 20 says that he's the reconciler and the savior. And then in 2.9, it says that all the fullness of deity dwells in Jesus. He is the Lord God Almighty. Selah. Pause. Think about that. Who says, come to me? The Lord God of the universe stands at the table and says, come to me. I want you to spend time with me. I want a relationship with you. In all my efforts to meet expectations and do something for God, had I missed what he wanted most of all for me just to come to him? I said I was going to challenge you um, to meeting with him. Let me share a little story with you before I do that. <clears throat> a month and a half or so ago, uh, my almost three-year-old grandson, Austin, was at the house, and we'd been outside playing and he got all dirty and came in we went into the bathroom and we were washing his hands and talking and now let me give it a little aside I have a little tray that I use for whitening my teeth I'm not obsessive about it but on occasion I remember to do it and so I had done that that morning and had just left it on beside the sink and so Austin's doing this and then he says Grandma is that your binky? <laughs> <coughs> well, after I could compose myself. You know, they're so cute and you want to laugh and sometimes you want to laugh when you shouldn't. But that was funny. And he, he realized, he, he thought he was funny. He, he is, but anyway. Later, I was thinking about that. Here, to it. Here is my two-and-a-half-year-old grandson. Oh, I'm about to lose this. Who drew a conclusion on the basis 
of his limited experience and knowledge. He just transferred what he knew to what he saw, which is very sophisticated learning and a, a, a sophisticated thought process. But then I was thinking, that's what I do. That's what we do in relationship to God. We determine who God is based on our experience, which may be very, very limited. And so I thought about that. You know, he was just drawing a, a comparison, and I do the same thing. But he was wrong with his conclusion, just like I'm wrong about the conclusions that I sometimes draw about God. And so what do we do with that? The one thing that will clarify, correct, keep us on track is God's word. And so over and over and over again, I will say, it's God's word. That's where we come to know him. We know his character. We know his ways. We know his thoughts. We learn his voice. We learn to hear his voice and can know when he's speaking to us because of that. We can know his heart, and he will, he will reveal himself to us. So why have a quiet time? I'm just going to jump in here with this. Why have a quiet time? A quiet time, a time with God. I'm going to call it a divine appointment. <clears throat> well, one is because he's invited us to come to him. And if we didn't have any other reasons, that's a pretty good one. Second, because we need it. You need it, I need it. Third, because the world needs to see Jesus in us. And that happens only when we're spending time in his word. So on that table, I have given you a, a page of spiritual appetizers, and there should be one for everybody. And I just want you to pass that around. And what it is, <clears throat> is 31 days of uh, a brief script, scripture passage and a plan. And the plan starts 30 minutes. Starts with five minutes of silence, of being still and knowing that he is God. And let me tell you, ladies, that's difficult for us because we, we don't know what to do with silence. There's noise and clamor and bustle and uh, everything all around us. You know, the radio's on, the computer's on, the television's on. The, you know, you've got your iPod, uh, your phone, and it's, it's craziness what we live with. But silence is the path to the heart of God, and we need some silence. So you've got 31 days here, <clears throat> and it starts out, and those first verses have to do with the significance of God's word. Then you get into some things about who God is. And um, so 30 minutes is what it takes. Now, that may be difficult for some of you. If you have young children, that's, that's hard sometimes. But you're, you're probably going to have to sacrifice something or rearrange your schedule or something to work that in. But let me tell you, it will change your life. And... The change will be for the better. So I challenge you about that. A divine appointment. A, oh, a few weeks ago, uh, a couple had asked us to go to dinner with them, and they lived uh, about uh, 40 minutes away, and so they were going to be at the house at 5.30. And um, 5.30 came, and they weren't there. Ten minutes passed. They still weren't there. Another 10 minutes passed, and they weren't there. And so then we were beginning to say, I wonder if we misunderstood. And so I called, and the woman answered the phone. And then I was stumbling all over myself. You know, I'm, I'm saying, you know, Sandy, did we misunderstand? Uh, uh, we thought we were going to dinner. And she said, oh, you didn't get the message? No, we didn't get the message. Well, her husband had called, but something happened, and we didn't get that message. So we rearrange, we re reschedule. 
But you know what? We were disappointed because we weren't going to be at the table with them. I want you to think about this. Envision this. Christ has invited us to come. He is there. He stands waiting to pull the chair back for us. And we don't come. I wonder, is he disappointed when we don't come? When I don't come? And let me tell you, ladies, I have learned over the years that it's a matter of choice. It doesn't matter how much time I have, how much time I don't have, what the, the schedule is. It's a matter of choice. I can be at home, not have anything on the agenda, and still not do it. It's a choice. And so I urge you to begin to make the choice to come to him and allow him to refresh your soul. <clears throat> You'll be moving from doing uh, to being, and then out of the overflow of the being as he changes who you are, conforms you into the image of, of himself, and you experience his peace and his rest, your life will be different. You know, our appetite for food is a gift. And uh, why I call this spiritual appetizers because I think the same thing is true for us. Um, during the last 18 months, I've had some digestive disorders and I lost my appetite and lost some weight too. That happens when you don't eat. Uh, but, you know, I didn't want to eat. I lost my interest, that God-given interest in eating, I lost that. Well, I had to begin to eat slowly and small portions uh, to regain that, and I have regained it. I'm enjoying food. I think the same thing is true spiritually. When we haven't been spending time with God's Word, we need some spiritual appetizers to whet our appetite, to stir up that hunger, and then we long for more of his word. And so I give you 31 days of spiritual appetizers to whet your appetite. So I'm still asking God, Lord, what about this rest business? I know that primarily God's rest is, comes in knowing him, just knowing him and settling in with him and, and sitting with him, enjoying him. That's kind of a new thought. You're just, you just enjoy him. But yes, I think he wants us to enjoy that relationship with him. I'm learning more about that. But as I thought about rest, I looked at R-E-S-T. And I started with the R. What, do we, what, what could I use? Recognize your need is where I started. And then Acts 3.19 says, repent and return and you will experience times of refreshing in the presence of the Lord. Oh, I love that. That verse came to me, and I thought, that's exactly what he's been saying. He's saying, come back to me. Not to the doing, or not to, you know, thinking I had to do something, but just come back to me. So, recognize my need. That's where we all need to start. The E. Expect God to be present. You know, sometimes I just go through my day and I haven't thought about him. But if I expect him, I think, okay, today, God, I want you to show up and show off. And you know what? He does, which is just amazing. And sometimes when I, my sensitive, after my sensitivity has been heightened, I see him. I see evidence of him all around me. My house faces the east. And one morning I walked out of my bedroom and it looked like my living room was on fire. And I dashed in there and here was the sun. It was just glorious. I mean, it was orange and dark orange, burnt orange. And I was shining on the hardwood floor and it was just this 
glorious moment. I just stood there with my mouth open. I hollered at James and said, come, you have to come see this. And he, and he came and we both just stood there in awe and said, thank you, God, for being a creative, wonderful God who, who gives us beauty to behold. Well, and then I walked into the kitchen. I had not been gone probably two minutes and I turned around and walked back and it was gone. It was over. But for that moment, I saw God's glory. When I lived here in Brigham and also when I lived in Hiram and I drove to Ogden, those mountains and then the clouds, those mornings when there are clouds and when that sun comes up, on more than one occasion, I was praising God down the road, saying, God, that's what it's going to be like. It's going to be even more than that when you returned. Oh, he wants to show himself to us. But he also wants to act on our behalf, and he also wants to answer our prayers. And so we ought to expect him to do that. Next is that S. Uh, this might be the hard one. Surrender your strategy. You know, I've got a plan. I've got it all worked out. I've had it in my grip, remember? And he's saying, uh-uh. Let, let go of this. So how do I go about doing that? Well, one thing is to saturate myself with his word and then to sit in silence with him. I think uh, sitting in silence will lead us to him in fresh, new deep ways. The T, trust in his next step. To trust really is to rest. You know, the God who created me and who's holding the world to, in place never sleeps, never slumbers. You know what? It, he's in control. He's got it figured out. From Genesis to Exodus, Exodus you read it. He shows up and shows off but he's also sovereign. It's all in his control, and his plan is working out. I love that old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And when I sing it, it's almost impossible for me not to take my face in my hands, to turn it, turn my face, but also because I imagine Jesus putting my face in his hands, looking full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. My um, grad school pastor used to say, glance at the circumstance, but gaze at the Savior. Oh, yes. Trust him. Trust him. Well, you know, when I was coming to that point uh, of restlessness and just crying out to God, I was desperate. Something needed to change, and I knew it was me. I'm wondering, are you desperate? I want to share with you a story of a, a desperate woman. <coughs> <coughs> Could you hand me that? In the summer, a group of a small group of women um, joined me at my house, and we decided to use Ann Graham Lott's method. It's not just Ann Graham Lott's. It's been used by many. But where you read a passage, then you report the facts, then you reflect on what you've learned, and then you respond to that. Well, if you do that, you will have read through and worked through a passage four times. And my, the things that you learn when you do that. You know, we just tend to, I tend to read over things, you know, and especially if it's a familiar passage, you go, oh, I know all about that. Oh, well, no, I don't know all about that. <coughs> and so we, we came, we were doing Mark, and we were going to get about halfway through Mark. We, were, we came to Mark 5, verses 21 to 37, about the woman, a desperate woman, and <clears throat> as I worked myself through that passage, I became, I, 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 I'm going to use this word, 
I have been struck by lightning, but I don't think this was lightning. I think this was God. I became just alive to the passage. I've, I've used the word electrified because it was as if it just became so real to me and I couldn't get it out of my mind. I, would, I was thinking about it. I was going to bed thinking about it, waking up thinking about it, thinking about this woman. And so I, I wrote a response to that. Here, here in fact, are my, my notes um, that I worked through that the women worked through. We had, we'd all read it and studied it and done this work, came together, and then we started talking about it. We talked about it for about an hour, and then all of this came to me. Just for context, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. <coughs> Jesus had been across the Sea of Galilee, and if you may remember, if you can think about Israel, the shape of Israel and the Sea of Galilee is up at the top and then you have the Jordan River and the Dead Sea is down here and Capernaum is up there on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. And so Jesus had gone away trying to get away from the crowds because the word was out that he was healing people, he was casting out demons and the crowds were just coming. I've tried to imagine how that might happen today, you know, that people would just be so hungry that they would want to come to him. So he had just arrived back on the left side of the Sea of Galilee, not very far from Capernaum. Capernaum was the home of Peter, and uh, that's where Jesus had kind of moved to, and he stayed there. If you were to visit Israel today and would go to Capernaum, you would go to what they believe was the house where Peter lived. And it would be like right here. And then, oh, maybe as far, maybe over to the front of the courthouse. The courthouse would kind of be like the synagogue, you know, if you can envision that distance. <clears throat> Jesus, as was his custom, went to the synagogue. And it was at that synagogue where he had taught and where he had healed. So again, a large crowd is coming, and they're pressing in around him. In the midst of that crowd, a synagogue official named Jairus came to Jesus because his young daughter was ill. In fact, she was nearing death. I, I believe Jairus knew that Jesus could heal, and I think probably he had witnessed Jesus healing the man with the withered hand on that Sabbath day that got him in so much trouble for doing something so good. But in spite of the crowd that was coming around, Jesus immediately responds to Jairus' statement, his request, and they, they set off. The crowds followed. I can just imagine the pushing and the shoving and jostling around, trying, people trying to get close to Jesus. And then, you know, I don't like, I don't like crowds like that. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable. I, we lived in Louisville, Kentucky when my husband was in seminary, and people would talk about going to the Derby, and there would be thousands of people crowded into the infield. I am not, no, not me. Uh, I... Didn't even like going to football games or something like that. I just don't like that. I'm very uncomfortable. It says, the text says that the crowd was pressing in on him. So there wasn't a lot of breathing room. But if I wanted to come to Jesus, I would have to set aside my discomfort. And right now, I might have to push aside some obstacles to carve out my time with him because other things will crowd out. Isn't that an interesting phrase that we use? All that crowds out the time. But other things can crowd that time out. In the midst of this noisy, bustling crowd, a woman who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years enters the scene. 
a woman. She's unnamed. She's alone. She could be every woman. She could be me. She could be you. She's not named, but she's identified by her ailment. She had had a hemorrhage for 12 years. We can assume that her hemorrhage was uterine, and because of that, she was considered unclean according to Jewish law. We could look up that Leviticus passage, but we won't. And because she was unclean, she was an untouchable. She was an outcast. Imagine for 12 years. I'm confident that she not only agonized physically, but emotionally, mentally, relationally, socially, and spiritually. Because she was cut off from her family, from her friends, from her religious community, and consequently, she felt cut off from God, from Yahweh. A couple of asides here. Um, I paused and thought, how often have I chosen to identify myself by some condition? Abuse, dysfunctional family, family, poverty, divorce, disease, um, a victim. What about you? As long as we do that, we're making excuses for not assuming responsibility for our attitudes and actions. Chuck Swindoll has said, life is 5% what happens to you and 95% how you respond to it. We can choose whether or not we are a victim or a victor. A second thing I thought about, having had cancer 21 years ago and having walked through that with a lot of other people as well, I know that many times... Uh, it's possible to feel isolated and lonely, uh, separated from friends and family. Because people are uncomfortable and they don't really know what to say, oftentimes they withdraw. But also, there is this sense, oh my, if I get close to them, maybe I'll catch it. I mean, that's, that's silly, but it's real. People subconsciously do that, even though cancer is not contagious and other things are not contagious, but we, we, take that, we take that on. And so I can imagine the same thing happening to this woman, especially if she wore that victim mentality and recounted repeatedly her woes, even though they were very real to her. I'm not making light of that at all. But then the next comment in the story just causes me to cringe up. It says, The woman had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. For 12 years, she had gone to every doctor that she could think of, every specialist that there was available, Perhaps she'd gone to naturopaths or homeopaths or nutritionists, perhaps even quacks, longing to be healed. She had endured much, and her condition only worsened. She had exhausted her financial resources, and she didn't have insurance or Medicaid. <laughs> I mentioned that within the past 18 months, I've had some... Um, digestive issues, and after six months and an endoscopy and a colonoscopy and a follow-through x-ray and some other things, it remained undiagnosed. I wasn't worse, but I wasn't any better either. But I was exhausted in only six months. I can imagine this woman. This woman was desperate. Without means without friends, without hope. 
Although Jesus had not extended that invitation to come to him, I am confident that there was someone who told her about Jesus and said, come to him. I can almost hear her heart's cry. What do I have to lose? I've tried everything else. What could it hurt? So she decided to become one of the crowd. Embarrassed about her condition, knowing her standing in the community, she was sure that Jesus wouldn't touch her. So she came up behind him in the crowd. I can imagine her just crushing in among the people and being, you know, maybe pushed back, uh, shoved aside, and yet she just kept, kept pressing on. And I can imagine her just pushing her arm through and, and thinking, oh, I, if I can just touch him, if I can just touch his garment, I know he will heal me. Can you feel the longing in her heart and sense, you know, the stretch of her arm? To her utter astonishment, the hemorrhage stopped immediately. Now, immediately happens to be one of Mark's favorite words. You see it a lot. But imagine, immediately, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. In August 2010, I uh, experienced a bout of cellulitis as a result, indirect result of cancer 21 years ago, and I was hospitalized for six days. For three of those days, I was septic, which means that I was experiencing blood poisoning. And on the morning of the fourth day, I woke up, and I was clear-headed, and I felt good. My bed was sopping wet, and I wanted to jump out of bed. And, uh, but I knew, I felt in my body that I was healed, and I was. Without interruption, the attention shifts from the woman to Jesus, who realized that the power proceeding from him had gone forth. Her healing had cost him something. Another observation. Though on his way to Jairus' house to care for his daughter, Jesus stops, turns around, and seeks out the woman who had done this. Jesus tends to individual needs in the middle of a crowd. Jesus knows every one of our needs in the middle of this crowd. I'm sure she thought she would just touch Jesus and then simply slip back into the crowd without his notice. But he turned around and asked, who touched me? You know, think about that. Who's asking this question? What a question. I'm sure I would do exactly what the disciples did when they said, Who touched you with all this crowd around and you're asking who touched you? I'm sure I would be just as skeptical as as they were. But Jesus knew the difference between the touch of nearness and the touch of desperate faith. Jesus knew who touched him. Who touched me? Jesus asked, a tightness fills my chest as I think about her being caught, so to speak. I can just envision the eyes of Jesus as he turns around and just goes through the crowd looking for her. And then those piercing eyes those eyes that are filled with love and compassion. Fearing and trembling, it says, the woman, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. 
who touched me? Jesus' question reminds me of God's query in the Garden of Eden when he says, where are you? God knew, yet he wanted them to acknowledge where they were hiding in guilt and shame. That's what he does with us. Where are you? Then he says, what are you doing there? And then he says, how's that working for you? I love that question. You know, people will tell me, ah, oh, don't talk to me about God. Don't talk to me about that Jesus stuff. I've got it all under control. Oh, every area of their life is a mess. And I say, and how's that working for you? Well, I think God would say that to us as well. Jesus' question brought the woman out of hiding. No more embarrassment, no more shame, no more isolation. Jesus didn't allow the woman to miss the blessing of publicly acknowledging him as she falls before him. I can hear her words just pouring forth like a gushing water as she recounts 12 years of futility and frustration in attempting to find a cure for her ailment. Tears fall, tears of anguish, tears of relief, tears of joy. And she comes, as she comes to the end of her story, Jesus speaks. He says, daughter, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And even though the text does not say this, I cannot imagine Jesus speaking those words to her, looking her in the face without his touching her. This woman who had not been touched for 12 years. Daughter, a tender familial name. She, she was no longer isolated. And then he says, your faith has made you well. Her desperate situation had led her to act in desperate faith. She had been afraid, but she believed. Go in peace, Jesus added. The biblical concept of peace is a state of wholeness and well-being because of a right relationship with God. Not only had the woman been healed physically, her soul had been refreshed and she had been restored spiritually. And while he was still speaking to the woman, someone came from Jairus' house and said, your daughter has died. Jesus shifts his attention from the woman to Jairus and says, don't be afraid, only believe. And they set out for Jairus' house. The nameless woman fades away into the crowd, no longer hiding, but nor walking with head bowed in shame. She's walking in grace and wholeness and well-being because she's encountered Jesus, and her life will never be the same. Are you desperate? Are you ready to take radical action? Of what do you need healing or deliverance? Have you been carrying around bitterness and guilt and shame and worry and unforgiveness for 12 years or longer? I carried unforgiveness for 30 years, and it nearly destroyed me. It affected my marriage. It affected my children. It affected my relationship with God. Are you hiding because you think your past sin can't be forgiven? Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. And I will not only refresh your soul, I'll forgive your sin and make you whole. You'll be set free. Are you exhausted because you've been caught up in religious activity, trying to Find your way to God, trying to earn your relationship with him. Are you running on empty 
Are you carrying around heavy burdens? Are you hungry? Are you restless? It matters not where you are or what your circumstances are. Jesus says, come to me. Come sit with me at the table. Feast on grace. Know that you're loved. Oh, that's our deepest hunger, to know that we are loved unconditionally. And he says, John 7, 37 through 39, when he says, if you're thirsty, come and drink. But the translation of that Greek is really keep on coming. It's not a one-time thing. It's keep on coming. It's for today. It's for yesterday, tomorrow. Keep on coming to me. Eating the bread of life and drinking the living water. Give me, give me your, your burdens and I will give you rest. What an incredible exchange. Then you will walk in freedom and wholeness and your life will never be the same. Every invitation has an RSVP, an opportunity to respond. If you received a letter from Buckingham Palace and Queen Elizabeth or maybe Princess Kate was inviting you, I dare say you would do everything possible to be there. You'd probably take an etiquette course. You'd buy a new outfit. I mean, that's the first concern, you know. But I'm telling you, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords has issued the invitation for you to come to him and sit in his presence and allow him to fill you with peace. Tonight, if you would, um, perhaps God is dealing with you or will, is gently wooing you, is calling you, Personally, we have a room for silent prayer. If you would like to pray with someone, you can go to anyone of um, Dorothy, others here who would um, take you to a quiet place. And I encourage you, don't leave without coming to him. Let's sing. <laughs>